Going back to your previous point, I, I want to share your optimism about the sort of globalizing humanitarian influence of technological and scientific advance. I, I and, and you're sort of speaking out for optimism about technology's ability to tie people together and familiarize them with each other and to transcend, you know, national boundaries or religious boundaries. This conversation, Matt McCormick and I talk about Nick Bostrom's vulnerable word hypotheses. Uh, we look at things like Drake's equation, Fermi's paradox. We also look at Nick's simulation sort of, you know, uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, we also get into a lot of uh, geopolitics and emerging trends. Uh, and important for me to uh, share that uh, the opinions expressed in this are uh, my personal opinions and uh, Matt's personal opinions, and they have nothing to do with uh, Algo or Matt's university. So just a little bit of a word of caution, uh, but just uh, uh, with that, uh, we talk a lot about uh, one Neumann, Neumann probes and where are all the aliens, if there are any, and uh, look at it from many different perspectives. So this is a uh, holiday style, uh, informal, uh, two friends talking. Uh, Matt certainly is very knowledgeable about uh, these things. So hopefully you uh, enjoy this conversation and have that much fun uh, the way the both of us had. And here is now part three of my conversation with none other than Matt McCormick. We now uh, officially met, we are men, friends. We were comparing uh, our Thanksgiving schedule and where you are going and where I'm going. So now I'm loving it. And this uh, topic that we're gonna talk about today, our audience is gonna love it too. First of all, you know, people are a big fan of uh, Bostrom and his, you know, body of work. So tell us a little bit about what are we gonna talk about today? Well, here's my idea. I, um, I, Bostrom's Vulnerable World Hypothesis paper is a pretty important, interesting paper in its own right. It is. And, and there's a lot of people, especially in public policy, who are looking at it seriously and talking about it. Um, and I kind of don't want to focus directly on his conclusions or, or his thesis in that art paper. I just want to use some of the the framework, the set, the, the, the frame setting framework ideas. And I want to get some other ideas into the discussion about the Drake equations, the Fermi paradox, um, and a few other things and talk about some big sort of philosophical sort of grand humanity scale questions that philosophers get excited about. Um, so I'm going to use Bostrom, but we don't have to focus directly on him. And I want to do something kind of weird. I, let me defend it first. Um, I think people sometimes get a bit um, impatient or uh, don't quite see the appreciate the point of spending time, you know, worrying about or thinking about these sort of wild, far-fetched science fiction scenarios. And and here's here's why I think we should do it. First off, Bostrom's got a really uncanny knack for uh, taking the big picture, zooming way out and getting a very novel sort of perspective from you know 60,000 feet looking down on us about where we fit in the grand scheme of things. Like, you know, like philosophers do, but he does it. He's very tech savvy. He's very mathematically savvy. And he's got some really remarkable arguments that sometimes produce outrageous conclusions. And even if we don't, end up accepting them, I think it's it's worth it as an exercise to kind of give some of it a, some thought and wonder about why it's wrong or if it's wrong or why we want it to be wrong um, and get the gears turning about these sort of big, big questions. And I think that helps us all deal with our small everyday problems, our little issues. When you, when you have this like radical sort of uh, transformation of perspective into a different, really different framework, you, you learn, 
here's here's what I think we all have learned. We all learned Boston's trick. Like you learn to do this thing he does so well because it lets you take a, a problem you're working on, you're stuck with, even a small, trivial, or sort of local problem, and flip it and like come at it from a really novel perspective. So he's a he's a really interesting thinker that way. And I and I think he's he deserves our attention, some of our attention for that reason alone. Yes, he does. So um, a little bit of background. Um, I want to talk about this vulnerable world hypothesis, which is about the uh, development of technology in civilizations like ours and what happens uh, when they do that. But let me give some other background stuff that I think is interesting. So um, I, don't, I didn't get a date on this, but uh, Enrico Fermi was allegedly, he was a famous physicist at the University of Chicago, I think. He's talking to some uh, physicist over lunch one day, this must have been in the 60s or 70s, and they're talking about the possibility of extraterrestrial life. And he did some, this is the way the apocryphal story goes, I think, is he did some back of napkin, napkin uh, calculations and came up with this thing that people call the Fermi paradox. And the Fermi paradox is basically asking this question, given how big the galaxy is, given how big the universe is, with so many potentially habitable, habitable planets, planets that have sort of, they're the Goldilocks zone for heat, for liquid water and the like. Given that there's so many of those, or we would expect the, the physicist, astrophysicists, uh, astronomers expected there'd be so many of those in the universe, why, why haven't we encountered any of them? Uh, because you'd expect that if aliens had achieved or reached, you know, if they'd, uh, even made some evolutionary development and they were even a hundred years ahead of us in terms of technology, you'd expect them to be able to start having a very big footprint at the speed of light in, with regard to communication and an expanding bubble in their sphere of influence. So you'd expect our bubble of, of information contact with our probes and our uh, telescopes and the like to be able to intersect with theirs at some point. So we obviously haven't found any. I'll just go on record for <laughs> saying, I hope that's not controversial to too many people. We haven't found any alien life forms yet. So the question, you know, his question was, well, where are they? What's going on? And there's, that's provoked a lot of speculation among physicists, cosmologists, astronomers, philosophers about what could be the explanations. Maybe there's some, you know, maybe there's some problem. Maybe the technological civilizations once, um, uh, life develops and becomes sentient, uh, achieves consciousness, maybe something happens. Maybe they kill themselves with their technology. Maybe they wipe each other out. Maybe they transform their existence with technology into something else. Or you know, maybe there's some other explanation for the silence. And then more recently, so, so that's the, the Fermi paradox. And there's lots of interesting questions about you know, what might be going on to explain the silence. Uh, another relevant background information here is something called the Drake Equation. And this is, um, I think, Frank Drake, 1961, actually tried to put some numbers on this. And the equation is, a, is an equation that gives us an answer to the question, how many technologically advanced civilizations would we expect to find in the Milky Way galaxy? And it's basic, basically just a big multiplication problem where we figure out how many stars are in the, in the galaxy, how many, uh, what fraction of those stars have planetary systems around them, what fraction of those are in the Goldilocks zone or have environment that's sustainable for life, and then what fraction of those would have uh, and possibly have intelligent life, and then you know develop technology, and then how much time do they have to develop it? So it's a, a more formal way of, of putting some numbers on the Fermi question. And what's happened in recent years, as I understand it, I, again, I'm out of my, I spent a lot of time out of my field, um, is that new astronomical techniques have given us the ability yeah. to find exoplanets. Um, the number, I don't have the chart on here, I can give it to you guys, but the number of exoplanets that we've discovered has just dramatically shot up in the last 20 years, because yeah. they're using some really powerful optical 
um, technology to measure the light coming from distant stars and they're able to measure small changes in the wavelength or small changes in the in the light from these stars and determine that not only that they have planets but how many planets they have how big they are and in many cases um what uh you know whether they're close or far from their suns which gives us an answer to this question about whether or not they're going to have liquid possibly have liquid water on them so um the the really surprising thing is that there turns out there's so many of them we're just now starting to see them so that fraction has shot way up the number of of you know potentially habitable um exoplanets in the system so the drake equation gives us now with new information gives us kind of intensifies the fermi paradox um setting us up for some of these questions i want to ask with bostrom yep okay so um there's also a a book recently that I've been reading that I'm really enjoying that I should mention. It's by a it's by a a, a biologist at Cambridge, and he's a he's a zoologist, and it's about the evolution of life on other planets. About what, if anything, could we figure out about the nature of aliens given what we know about evolution? Okay, one more idea, and this comes from another sort of 20th century intellectual giant, um, John von Neumann. So, and I don't know the background story for when von Neumann proposed this idea, but it's kind of a, once you see it, it's really clear, it's really obvious. In fact, there's people who are working on projects like this. So a von, von Neumann probe yeah. is a space probe that you launch and you send it to another, send it out into the solar system or further. And you build it so that it can um, seek out and gather ma materials, maybe from an asteroid belt, maybe from the surface of a moon, especially metals. So you build it, you know, basically with a, you know, a 3D 3D printer, uh, self self um, program, self operating 3D printer system on it, so that it can gather the materials to duplicate itself and build more of itself. So the idea then is. And we're not far from being able to build something like this. There's already people, you know, um, there's some startups in Silicon Valley where they're working on um, 3D printers that can operate using Martian uh, soil. Yeah. Trying to figure out what we can build with, you know, the materials available on the surface of Mars. So the idea is then is if you build a von Neumann probe, you launch it into space, it gathers up some metals from an asteroid belt, builds two more, those two more launch further into space and then they gather up the metals and they build two more or even more. And so you get this combinatorial function here so that it, you know, very quickly you populate a huge bubble of space around you with von Neumann probes that are moving out at whatever velocity you can get them moving at. They're, they're spreading the circle of your influence or your contact out further and further very rapidly. So even in a really short time, von Neumann probes, once you get them started, they're going to propagate into this huge sphere. Okay, so again, if alien civilizations, if they're out there, and if they're even 100 years ahead of us technologically, then you'd expect them, this is a really simple and obvious idea, you would expect them to be able to do that. So why one have- thing, uh, One thing we add on that is that, uh, do you think that some constraints play, you mentioned some constraints, but some other fundamental constraints play a role into why we don't see uh, all the aliens and their drones flying around and uh, all that good stuff because speed of light, when you look at it from a cosmic perspective, it's pretty slow in the sense that if we just were to, at speed of light, go to the nearest star that is x million light years away or whatever or whatever that is uh, or whatever you know uh, how many light years away that is so even when you travel at speed of light uh, it takes a lot of time to to get there uh, and that is why you know on the cosmology side of things uh, the light reaching us from ancient parts of the universe now has given rise to all this wonderful new wave of physics 
uh, in the different branches of cosmology. Do you think that that is a contributing factor that because of the speed of light kind of people are trapped into uh, where they are for the most part and even if they try uh, that they can't you know easily get from point a to b knowing the physics of today the other quick point i'll mention is that certainly if you are approaching speed of light then uh, special relativistic relativistic effects kick in which means that it is going to be uh, a pretty much a one-way journey uh, because from wherever you are coming from, uh, even if you come back, they would be long gone by that time because of all the time dilation. So, so just wondering that is the setup such that it is designed to kind of you know keep everybody in their own uh, in their own right. circles. Right. So, you know, with humanity, we've sometimes people say one of the first signals we send into space was Hitler doing the um, opening ceremonies at the 1938 Berlin yeah. Olympics. Yeah. So we've only been sending out signals at the speed of light for less than 100 years. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of possibilities here. And again, even if a an alien civilization is a hundred or a thousand years ahead of us. That means they've got a hundred or a thousand years ahead of us on that expansion of that light cone. Yeah. Not even with probes. So obviously you send out probes at sub speed of light, maybe much lower than speed of light, obviously, but um, signals are going to go out much faster. So if they were even a little bit ahead of us technologically or at work on this project a hundred or a thousand years ahead of us, then you'd expect their sphere of influence to be bigger and bigger. But you're absolutely right. W the fact that we have not uh, encountered any such signal or drone or contact suggests that there's some either deep separation, spatial deep separation such that um, just the, the just the physics of the traversing the distance is not making it possible. So it, so it seems so it seems lonely for us all, or temporally we're out of sync with some yeah. alien civilization, such that we're way behind or they're way ahead and they they're doing something else, or there's something else going on here where people want to keep their heads down, they don't want to draw attention to themselves, or there's you know um, Bostrom's. Boston's vulnerable world hypothesis comes up here too. And another philosopher I'll mention is Susan Schneider, who's given sort of a, the, the counterpoint argument to some of these, who said, we don't want to be sending out a von Neumann probe or these sorts of signals because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves because the probability of encountering some hostile or yeah. incompatible um, alien technology or, or alien beings is too high or too unknown. We have to be agnostic about their character, or we have to be fearful about their character, given the you know distribution of possible temperaments we might run into here. Um, so maybe there's something that the alien races figure out that we haven't figured out yet, or that we're going to face as a dilemma soon about whether or not we want to do it. Or in our case, we may well end up having some, you know private billionaire who decides to take matters into their own hand and do do their own project here, whether as whether humanity as a whole wants to do it or not. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I have some ideas about I, I, I thought I might throw some ideas at you about um, the, the questions about private space exploration, but I wanted to raise all that to get us kind of thinking about those questions and okay. then see if I can kind of take a pass at this vulnerable vulnerable world hypothesis yeah. for Bostrom and get us thinking about that. So, and I found, I, I when I first read this paper of his, I just found the metaphor so striking. Um, Bostrom says something like this, imagine or, or, or use this metaphor, think of our devising some technological innovation or making some scientific, you know, progress, step progress forward is like reaching into an urn. We don't know what's in the urn. We, we reach in and we pull out a marble. The marbles, let's say, 
are white if they're technological or scientific discoveries that are relatively benign or safe to humanity. They're black if those technological uh, or scientific discoveries are deadly or destructive to life on earth. Or they might be gray if they have some mixed application. So we got this urn of, of mysterious proportions. We don't know what, you know, what articles going to get published in nature next week <laughs> that might expose some potentially you know disastrous technology and he spent some time talking about the really the really obvious the really good example here is, is nuclear power uh, that you know were it not for a number of sort of interesting historical contingencies uh, nuclear weapons for example might be, readily available, easily built, um, easily come by uh, from the beginning. You know, it, it turns out that, that when Szilard and Einstein and Oppenheimer and Niels Bohr and the scientific community were sort of stumbling on or, or sort of working out the details in the 20s and 30s about how nuclear power could work, they were having these quiet discussions in people's living rooms about whether or not they should let on to the world leaders, um, the Germans or whoever else about what the power was potentially available there with the uh, you know, splitting the atom. And there were some heart, some serious conversations, you know, in living rooms in Princeton and the like where people were asking whether or not we should suppress this information, whether we're not whether or not we should be afraid of uh, governments getting hold of the information and so on. Uh, so there's a great book by Richard Rhodes called um, "The History of the Atomic Bomb." It's the yeah. standard history on that. Have you read it? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just a great book, yeah. Um, yeah. and it tells all of these stories in great detail. Very interesting. So it turns out that by by luck, for us, uranium. See if I can get this right. Uranium 235 is a, I'm trying to get this wrong. I think 238 is the common isotope, and 235 is unusual. And it, just, this tiny, just a tiny speck of 235 per you know, metric ton of normal uranium that you mine. So the, the right kind of uranium that you then process into plutonium is very, very rare. It take, you have to process hundreds or thousands of tons of regular uranium just to get a tiny little amount. Yeah. And as I understand it, if I remember right, for the Manhattan Project, they set up this enormous facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee with you know, thousands of people working in all this equipment and working on all these, these separators and centrifuges to try to distill out and get this tiny amount of, uh, you know, a couple of basically grapefruit sized uh, piece, you know, uh, um, yeah. amounts of purified this uranium isotope so that they could build those two nuclear bombs. And those are the only ones they had. Yeah. Um, the two that they dropped on Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we're, we're somewhat better at producing nuclear fissile material now, but still, you know, to this day, I think, and I'm, again, I'm out of my element here, but take the, the challenge we've had with Iran over the last several decades of them or even, or North Korea, of them trying to pursue their own nuclear weapons program. And we've trying to impl implement global political pressure and, and trying to use embargoes and political you know, uh, influence to try to prevent those programs from developing. But one of the major things that's worked out in our advantage is that it's just really hard to gather up enough of the material yeah. to build nuclear weapons. Yeah. And what Bostrom's worried about is that through some slight change, some different, slightly different counterfactual scenario where physics are different or or if it had turned out that building a nuclear bomb was as easy as using a magnet or using a magnet, a piece of glass and a piece of metal, or by through some other accident, if it had turned out to be sort of, you know, surprisingly easy by chance, then you'd get this crisis. You'd have this problem that you'd have this proliferation 
this ready availability of of a really you know massively deadly dangerous technology a couple of questions that are uh, uh relevant i think at this very juncture are first is it fair to assume that in the universe uh physics is same everywhere and universe is pretty much the same it's not that we have one physics and somebody else has a different physics that what would be <clears throat> excuse me modern philosophy's take as to what is a more likely scenario and then this person put footnotes like that hey you know uh all notions that you know some parts of the universe are uh, special and very differentiated from others uh over time those things keep getting proven uh not not right and it it's more probable since big bang kind of happened everywhere if you look at the observable universe that uh physics is same everywhere and this some other quick anecdotal type comments that uh, uh that sometimes there is a uh exotic description of observable universe and you know and far far apart from from us you know some part of the universe is getting into that unobservable thing because of the speed of expansion and all that fun stuff but then this person say at the same time we too where we are are becoming unobservable for those who are over there right. so and here we are this is a pretty normal part of the universe probably right. there is a dark matter here we can't perceive it and we at every moment we too are getting unobservable for somebody who is out there the same right. way they are becoming unobservable for us so their question is right. is it fair to assume that physics or the laws of physics are pretty much same everywhere thermodynamics entropy error of time all that fun stuff gravity quantum mechanics or is it more likely that different pockets of the universe have more exotic or different physics and suddenly they know sir that you are a philosopher so then the question to you is what is modern philosophy's take on this question of one physics or many potential physics out there uh, it's been a little while since i've reviewed some of that um some of what's going on there but look what what modern philosophy's take ought to be is what the astronomers and cosmologists tell us about the about the universe and um a good source of information here is uh, Sean Carroll's the big picture yeah very, very accessible book um yeah. and he actually uh, he's a passable um at with his philosophy skills and he does a decent job tackling even the philosophical issues but the book is about all the big questions and he's an expert physicist and he explains um all the detail, details there so the fermi paradox worries and the drake equation worries that i was describing are ones that apply to sort of our local galaxy let's say so the milky way nearby objects and as i understand it the, the our universe is the larger context in which we all exist and that originates with the big bang uh 13.7 billion years ago and we've also recently discovered that not only is there this continuous expansion but as everything from this singularity point 13.7 billion years back um starts to expand um it not only is it moving out and everything spreading out but it's moving out faster and faster as it goes so you're right with our sort of immediate not galactic neighbor so much because that's not so measurable there but but in the really big picture there's this sort of long term you know expansion where everybody's getting more and more lonely more and more isolated so that's a big picture challenge overcoming this you know these distance gaps um and i think that according to modern physics then they put that whole story that i just told within the context of a multiverse explanation where the multiverse is a mathematical physical construct theory that they've come up with to explain some of the observables that they get at quantum mechanics and the like 
uh, where our universe is just one of infinitely many universes that are all within the multiverse, those universes are not traversable across back and forth, at least because of the distances or because of the differences between them. But also, according to some versions of this, those different universes instantiate different sets of physical laws. So those are the, the and perhaps mm -hmm. all of the possible arrangements of internally consistent physical laws get instantiated in, 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 in those different universes. So when I say our universe, I mean our universe where these laws hold. And, and, I, and I believe that the assumption is in physics is that um, they, all of the evidence that they have from our Big Bang out is that all of the matter and all of the stars and all of the universe that we can observe all conforms to or abides by the same set of physical laws. So they do assume that. Uh, and I think it's a well-justified assumption. Now, the, the change here is that uh, physics is different or the physical laws that govern um, at any given time are a function of the heat and energy and density of the universe. So after the first few, and I'm gonna get the details wrong here, but after the first few picoseconds or nanoseconds after the expansion, the singularity as, um, the particles, the original particles start to expand and cool off and energy levels go down, then you start to see some of the um, physical laws that we observe in our universe as um, the behavior of, of uh, matter all emerges as the expansion happens and things start to cool down. So this is a relatively cool, low energetic state. Things act like they do on, you know, when we're running our experiments on planet Earth. But at the first few, you know, fractions of a second after the Big Bang, uh, there, was, there were different behaviors, different physical behaviors of matter. But that's all according to um, a larger structure of physical law. Yep. Uh, but again, I'm way out of my league here. I'm just giving kind of the highlights of what I know. All, you know one of the interesting, interesting things that I've done recently is in my philosophy of religion class, um, just to head off some of, you know, some of these questions, I just start the course with, okay, here's the current state of play in modern physics and cosmology about what the, how old's the universe, where did all the matter that we know come from, what's the Big Bang, you know, when did the Earth, the Earth formed four billion years ago, life, abiogenesis occurs on Earth about three and a half billion years ago. And I give them kind of a, a grand history of everything, a quick rundown of, you know, the, the really big uh, expansion of hominid brain cavities happens about 2 million years ago, where you get early hominids evolving into modern humans and all this sort of expansion of, of their intellectual capacity happens very recently and right up to the present. So I kind of give, give all my students a, a quick rundown of here's what we think about the state of things. And whatever else you want to say about religion or about God or about anything else you believe about the rest of uh, the world, you're going to have to account for this. You've got to fold this in somehow. You can't just ignore this or write this off. Or if you do, you've got to have better grounds for rejecting all of that from physics okay. and cosmology than you have for um, accepting it. You know, and you have better grounds for the, these, you know, these reasons you've got for rejecting them. So I kind of lay that down as the first line in the sand. Yeah. Okay, we, here's the facts, we gotta deal with this. Not to say that you can't hold any kind of theological views in that context. I mean, I, I don't, but some people do. And I just say, fine, you've gotta, you gotta face these facts too. You can't be just a sort of de in denial about that. Okay, I'm a bit far afield now. Um, so I think that the short answer is in our universe, physics is the same throughout. Yeah. Um, and then according to uh, multiverse theory, um, another good person to look at here is Max Tegmark. Um, I've, got an yeah. article, I've got an article or two I can send you. Um, and in, according to multiverse theory, you see the instantiation of different sets of physical laws in different universes. Uh, but those are way beyond the scope of any of our von Neumann probes or our ability to go yeah. probe, right? Those are far too far away. So the problems we're worrying about are local by comparison. Yeah. Even though they might be thousands of light years away.
Um, okay, so the vulnerable world hypothesis then is this idea that um, if a technological civilization like our own keeps going, so we've had this rapid onset of technological and scientific ability and things are accelerating, you know, where we've gone from horse-drawn carriages, you know, 150 years ago to space flight. So we've had this rapid expansion of our technological capacity. So if that keeps developing, that's those developments are like reaching into the urn and pulling out a marble. And we don't know. And interestingly, Bostrom says, I don't have any uh, attitude or any any uh, view about this, just about what the distribution of marbles are in that urn. All I know is, for example, with nuclear uh, technology, we've managed that that amounts to a gray marble because yeah. it's got great positive potential. We've made great use out of it and gotten great benefits from it, but it's also has enormous destructive potential. So there's an example of technology, the technological advancement we pulled out of the urn and we've managed to just dodge the bullet there, but we got very close and very tense and very had a lot of conflict over it. And we've had, you know, cold wars and and we've had 70,000 nuclear weapon buildups on both sides of the Soviets and the Americans. And we've had very tense, um, you know, it's a very, I called it a, a, a close call. Even worse, when you find out about recent, you know, recently lots of these documents have been declassified. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of these close calls that happened during the nuclear age and all this tension with Soviets. There was a a Soviet missile commander who refused to take an order yeah. um, and decided on his own that he shouldn't launch. And it turns out it was a mistaken order. It was a, uh, and he shouldn't have, and he saved us all and nobody knows anything about it. There was a nuclear missile silo in Arkansas that caught on fire one night and burned down. It was the middle, almost in this suburban neighborhood. And uh, there was this whole crisis with that thing. And, and there've been a number of these like, you know, they've been we got close ones. few. We got close several times, and uh, you mentioned Max Stagmark. He does, you know, from time to time, uh, he uh, celebrates all these unsung, right. unmentioned heroes who, right. uh, uh, probably because of them, we are all here today. Uh, yeah. But it speaks to that Bostrom's point on right. uh, the gray marbles uh, right. in the vulnerable world hypothesis, and. Foster spent some time in the article playing around with different variations on theme. I mean, maybe it's a technology that takes a you know, nation state's resources to develop, and maybe it takes thousands of people and lots and lots of resources and lots of time in order to invest and get the thing up and running, you know, like the nuclear weapon. Or, um, and I'm trying to remember where I found or I heard this, I think he said it in an interview somewhere, you know, imagine that within a few years from now, we start building really capable uh, molecular 3D printers that yeah. you can order off of Amazon for a few hundred dollars. So now all it takes is, you know, an Islamic fundamentalist who's intent on destroying Israel to yeah. create a, you know, a virus that yeah. singles out anyone with Jewish genetics and, you know, wipes out, you know, some targeted, targeted bio weapons. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you know, and you start realizing something like that could 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 easily become readily available. Yeah. So you've got this problem where you don't have sufficient governmental supervision or maintenance, or maybe you don't even trust the government because they can't be trusted to do it either. We and we've got this diversity of opinion and motives and goals. You know, there's the guy who just drove his car into a crowd of Christmas parade a few days ago. Um, you know, there's certainly the will out there in some people's minds to do great damage. And one of the things that's stopping them is they don't have the power of the money or the ability. So were they to have access to some technology like this, they could do massive harm. That is that is a very true statement. So we're pulling out all these marbles all the time and wondering yeah. um, and hoping for the best. And we don't have any and I'll say a few words here about what Foster was doing with this. So it's kind of the grim, the implications are grim. Um, I mean, this is a very kind of um, uh, stark and depressing conclusion here, but Bostrom then worries about, okay, so as a matter of policy, and this is what he does at his 
future of humanity institute is worry about these sorts of things ahead of time sort of a doomsayer about this yeah as a matter of policy we should be prepared and get on the front of this just like with the ai super intelligence problem and it would be better if we could come up with some kinds of policy decisions or ways to handle this before it happens than trying to deal with it once the cat's out of the bag um so maybe we need global massive global you know surveillance state where everyone's being closely watched and monitored maybe we need you know effective government agencies and policing that can shut down a technological development like that maybe we need some way some capacity some way to suppress information or suppress knowledge you know all of these sound like really scary and really philosophically objectionable uh prospects and it's not that Bostrom is necessarily advocating for any particular one of them, but he's trying to run through and make a full list of what, if anything, could we do to try to deal with all this? Is it fair to assume, Matt, that the same way life cannot be contained and it always finds a way to yeah. uh, break away and run away and all that good stuff that can be say the same thing about technology as well? irrespective yeah. of its use that the technology and its innovation and pace that those processes uh, that they probably cannot be contained uh, either and yeah. they will continue going what what sort of your take on uh, take on that yeah well when I was young I was very sort of um, uh, uh, very enthusiastic about this idea. I was very intent on it. I grew up in a sort of repressive religious, you know, town in, in the Midwest. And I really resented and, and um, was bitter about attempts to control what I read and what music I listened to and what information I had access to. And I it made me a, a sort of very um, rabid defender of free speech. And and the free exchange of ideas. And I still have this commitment to, you know, an open discussion and open a sort of a mill style uh, freedom of inquiry where we all have open, uh, the open safe opportunity to exchange ideas, even crazy ones with each other, work out the details with each other. Uh, I still feel sort of ideologically committed to those ideas. Um, it, which puts me at odds with some of the sort of contemporary developments in the, you know, the liberal politics on campus, uh, because there's some sort of illiberal and free speech suppressing forces at work on the left that are, you have, have good intentions, but they, they yeah. want a lot of our ideas or a lot of our discussions to be stifled or choked or prevented or, or um, banned or canceled or what have you. So um, that's another kind of conflict, but Bostrom's raising a new question, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know how you. I don't know how you achieve real containment on ideas here. I mean, the the example from the nuclear, the development of the nuclear bomb is really informative because that Richard Rhodes book is great for this because there's all these physicists all over in Germany. There's physicists, there's a program in Japan where they're working on a, a, a bomb program. They didn't get very far, but the Soviets are obviously doing it. The Soviets had spies planted within the Manhattan Project who yeah. were taking the information <laughs> and the, the, the discovery straight from um, uh, New Mexico back to the Kremlin. And so the Soviets tested their own nuclear bomb just a few years after the Americans built their first, um, you know, built those, did those tests, those Trinity tests uh, in the desert. So it was like there was a kind of zeitgeist here where all the, the, the you know, physicists on the planet, at least the ones who were reading the journals and the ones who were up on the front edge of the discipline, they were having these conversations. Some of them thought it was impossible I was trying to find the story, track down the story. There was somebody who gave a speech right there in the 30s. I might have been Rutherford. It wasn't Niels Bohr, but there's somebody who gave a speech denying that it was possible to split the atom. And I think it was uh, Zillard who went the very next day, went on a long walk and figured out how to do it and published the paper and said, here's how you do it. Um, so 
they were all struggling with it, but they all knew it. And even if you didn't put it, publish it in the journals, they were talking and they were all close enough in development in their own labs that people saw the implication. So if it hadn't been, you know, um, Niels Bohr in Copenhagen or hadn't been somebody um, else would have figured it out. Somebody in Chicago, somebody else would have figured out just somebody else. Of, it was only a matter of, of it was only a matter of, of time. time. So considering that, Matt, if uh, uh, we assume for a sec that in some branch of this simulation of our thinking here, the free market economy and innovation, it continues on the current pace and, uh, and, and good guys and good ideas uh, somewhat outweigh uh, bad guys and bad ideas and whatnot. In that kind of a lifeline, what do you see as our future as individuals? Will we be more uh, cyborg-y in the future? We will get rid of all the hardware that falls apart. You know, we will, you know, fix all the, at the molecular level, you know, we'll regenerate limbs, we'll, you know, say different body parts. So what is you, you know, you have a good sort of thinking about it. So if we continue on this, you know, path, uh, what, what do you see in, if we are able to continue for 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years, what is the future of us as people? In that question, we are not all destroying ourselves. Uh, somehow the, the good, for my simplistic analogy here, the good guys uh, you know, outweigh the bad guys and uh, there's a part of, civilization that continues to make you know progress what would we look like uh, the future of us because we are certainly going to innovate what we already are much faster than biological evolution ever occurred and we are taking charge you know with our consciousness and this higher order control as we are becoming more and more self-aware and more capable we can hack into this and hack into that biologically what do you see happening yeah. to us? I've spent a lot of time, probably more than I should, reading uh, science fiction novels and thinking about dystopian futures versus utopian futures. And yeah. you, know, you can think of sort of Blade Runner-esque cyberpunk dystopian futures. Yeah. In contrast, you know, with things where, where things go dark and bad, which Bostrom specializes in lots of those, versus these kind of utopian Star Trek futures where... The, the spread and access to knowledge and efficiency of technology empowers everyone and brings everyone forward and liberates us to be able to pursue these noble things like exploration and knowledge and intellectual growth and all that. I'd love it if you know the utopian future was in our cards. And when I was a kid, I felt like that was, you know, that was what I dreamed about. But I, you know, that it there's a lot here to worry about. Tying into what you've asked and what you what I was talking about in the last question too, is that I used to think of, you know, the, the advent of the internet and especially the access to Google and us having so much instantaneous access to so much information. Naively, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I thought of that as being this sort of watershed event in human history that would overcome and eliminate lots of ignorance and lots of, uh, I mean, it's just, it sounds comical when I say it now, but I can kind of mimic the way I talked about this in the nineties. I thought of that as a kind of great democratizing effect where anybody suffering from religious oppression in some little village in the Middle East or someone, you know, anybody with internet access anywhere on the planet would have access to ideas and knowledge and information and would, would thereby be liberated and sort of local oppression and local harm to them would be mitigated by you know, them having, being able to grow intellectually. But obviously this is all, this is all you know, naive and silly sounding now in the sort of post-Trump, um, this epistemic apocalypse that we've been going through where it's come, you know, we've all come to find out that among other things, what happens is when you give everyone such immediate instantaneous information access to each other, 
is that lots of the people who had dangerous ideas, who weren't well informed, who weren't making good choices, and maybe they had crazy conspiracy ideas, lots of those people who were formerly kind of isolated in their, you know, towns or villages or whatever, are now all instantly connected to each other. And they're able to network and they're able to sort of snowball and those those bad ideas, wrong ideas, wrong headed ideas and, and dangerous values are getting um, this opportunity to explode in the world. So, and with each new generation we're, we're you know, as the, as the tech, especially social media, as it develops so rapidly, each new generation has got to find its way through all that. So yeah. um, they don't have as much time to think or ponder or sort of puzzle it out, work out the details of how to get along with other, other people. And they're getting access to more and more crazier ideas and faster. And I think the consequences are really dire. I think we've got a kind of information apocalypse now that's doing great harm to people. So back to answer your question, what's going to happen with us technologically? Well, another one of my favorite authors, William Gibson, uh, who wrote Neuromancer, yeah. says, uh, he says, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And it's, it's so prescient, what he's, what he's getting out there, is that there are pockets, there are places, there are people who know people who are on that technological cutting edge or who have access to some of those great medical or cybernetic or technological advancements like you're talking about. And they're going to be able to employ those and they will, and that will change them. And we'll get this sort of transhuman future here when we start you know, increasing our ability to genetically manipulate our fetuses or uh, biologically alter our bodies um, or medical advancements and technological achievements that will enable us to live longer. And here's another relevant point. I, I like to call this the, um, the, the medical singularity. It, there may be a kind of upper limit or maybe a kind of a, a lumpy curve on this point, but we're approaching this threshold where you know, humans have had an average lifespan of well, you know, well, well, their average lifespan is well under 50 for eons. And now, you know, it's edging up into the 70s. And we're, or in the, maybe in the 80s, and we're on perhaps on the verge of having our medical technology be good enough that we're going to be able to make a radical jump or expansion in human lifespan. So that people, some, maybe some of the people that are alive now, I'd like to make it to this threshold. Maybe, probably my kids will. Some of these people, some generation here very soon will be the first generation to live to 100, live to 150 or live to 200 years. If we make it across, if they make it across that medical singularity threshold, that's gonna change demographics and that's gonna change political dynamics and that's gonna change population uh, configuration radically because it's going to change everything, right? It will that right. will be right. you know considering systems are nonlinear. There's all this nonlinear dynamics. Uh, that kind of a thing where some people get to live to celebrate their 200th birthday that will significantly change uh, you know the makeup of the civilization. Uh, it, it'll change the, the demographics of just how many old people are alive in the population. And anytime you've got more or less of them. Hey, maybe they wouldn't be old anymore, Matt. So if, right. uh, if we right. fix in hopefully in your medical singularity, the right. moment we are past that singularity on the other side of it, you know, it is the youthful exuberance right. and all that good stuff. Right. But my, my point is that if you've got people who are nominally a hundred years old, even yeah. if they're feeling fabulous and playing tennis and all that. Um, and you've got more of them, the population. So right now you've got this population of, you know, from newborn to 80 yeah. and you've got your percentage, just your bell curve distribution of people on, you know, in these different age brackets. So as soon as you bump out one of these categories, you change all the dynamics of, of all this sort of systems fall apart when all of us on our 
hundredth birthday, we still show up to collect our social security checks right. or right. our our life yeah. insurances and whatnot. All those models, those institutes, they right. will break. Right. Those will all crash. I mean, they're already threatening to crash on us now, so they certainly will then. So that's going to change everything. Um, and it's so one. Of, my first point here was to that. Uh, one of the changes we'll see, at least in these pockets, in these bubbles for people who have access to those sorts of technological ability, yeah. abilities is that they're going to achieve some of these cybernetic or transhuman or new stages that you hinted at. But then there's going to be lots of people still, you know, some of them, uh, well, I mean, we're bringing lots and lots of people out of poverty every day. So you know, Steven Pinker's book about the age of enlightenment, enlightenment now, that's the name of it. You, Pinker documents sort of the ways in which everybody's lives have qualitatively and quantitatively gotten better steadily. And we're still bringing lots and lots of people out of poverty and, and better feeding them, better supplying them with, you know, economic growth on the planet. So those prospects seem like they're good. Uh, Pinker's got a bunch of uh, detractors and objections, but I won't deal with those right now. Um, those prospects are good, but we still get this sort of information problem where, you know, this, this QAnon business that came up during the Trump administration was a real eye opener for somebody like me who's trained in sort of classic rational enlightenment values and thinks of, thinks of education and information the way I did, the kind of naive way I was describing the way I do. And just the, how, how easy it was during the Trump years to derail a great big segment of the population and send them off into these sort of, forgive me, delusions, really dangerous, um, destructive delusions. So we still have, you know, anti people, pro, people were down the street from me here in Sacramento, in the cap capital of California. They were protesting vaccines down there two weeks ago. Big, great big demonstration where not only are they don't want vaccines for themselves, but they're out there protesting, arguing that nobody should get them. Um, and they don't want mandates. And just, just to my mind, in some ways, it's just sort of, I was surprised at how fragile the equilibria and the sort of the um, order and organization of culture and uh, society was and how easy it was to disrupt it and send us off into chaos with stuff like that. I think that is a great point, uh, Matt, that you're making. Many of these complex systems, their uh, equilibriums are very sort of unstable yeah. And slight perturbation can cause them to go out of equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, and then there are, you know, things like life forms where there is no equilibrium and you just, you know, are beating entropy and, uh, you know, there, there is no actual equilibrium point. So that's a very good point that we are always society, that big organism is living on a very yeah. sharp, sharply edged equilibrium where some perturbation can cause a widely different trajectory. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good point. One thing that I'll just quickly point out is just going back to our, uh, where we started, uh, aliens and where are they? When uh, you look at uh, uh, Mars, it looks like, you know, it, all indications are, it once had an atmosphere, it had, you know, water or something like water running around and rivers and trains and all that. And now it's all gone. And uh, because, you know, our speculation is, oh, the gravity is not really where it needed to be. And this other distance is not. So if you distill all those arguments, you say, well, the fine tuning where Earth is in distance to sun and the gravity that we experience here and this and that, and we still have our magnetic field and blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
to me, when I read that, just as a software engineer, I say, well, okay, that is a very sort of, you know, extremely fine-tuned description uh, of, an ex of a planet, considering that we are an exoplanet for some, we are an exoplanet as well, right. that you have that. Uh, but then I also find that you were just talking about uh, the uh, what went on for past few years, uh, that equilibriums are, you know, short-lived and they uh, uh, can go out of whack very quickly in a complex system. So that I think is a pretty uh, important point, sir, that you are making. Yeah, and and the the advent of these technological achievements or these scientific achievements uh, amount to a kind of chaos agent that creates this rapid change. So in many ways, it's very good, obviously, it does remarkable good for lots of us. But, you know, part of what's going on here with QAnon is that basically we've got paleolithic brains that were developed over eons, over millions of years in a relatively stable kind of environment where, you know, we were struggling to find enough nuts and berries, enough calories to make it through the day and dealing with basic hominid problems of survival and, and um, procreation and the like. So you get a, one set of cognitive tools that develops uh, and is adaptive to that set of uh, challenges. And your basic hardware for any given baby born today is the same basic functional you know, hardware in the brains and nervous systems of one of those babies. So you now, but you're now putting them into these environments, scientific and technological environments that are radically different and than, than anything they developed for or that the hardware equips you for. And um, they're having to find their way through it. They're having to sort of figure out tools. So one, one question I have, I don't have any answers for you about this, but you know, I've been watching my kids, for example, the way they um, are trying to navigate and figure out how to deal with all the social media problems. Because you know, all the classic problems of high school get all amplified once everybody's on TikTok or on Instagram or Snapchat or something, and they're all doing what high school kids do to each other. But now they're doing it instantly, doing it on their phones and doing it networked in this whole new way. And what's going to happen here is that as those technological abilities advance, every new generation of kids is going to have to develop a set of you know, critical thinking skills and, and tech set, sort of, they have to develop some street savvy for how to deal with, you know, the, the, the embarrassments or the problems or the ridicule or the bullying or the challenges or the, 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 the problems of, of a teenager's life, for example, that are now getting exacerbated and distorted or inflamed or uh, accelerated by access to technology. And likewise, I'm finding it in the classroom that people are coming in with um, ideas that would have been more fringe, would have been less, would have had less traction, and they're coming in sort of fully equipped to talk about them because they're getting reinforced and supported by their, you know, uh, QAnon conspiracy, you know, communities or whatever, um, and that stuff's kind of Give taking me some, you, just to put things in perspective, using your just classroom and maybe you can change things a little bit. Give me some couple examples of the uh, some of these fringe ideas. Well, um, the the Q, the core of the QAnon idea is that there's a there's a secret cabal of of powerful demo, democratic world global leaders who are running a secret child sex ring. And uh, at some point, some of the QAnon people got it in their heads. Uh, I, they got a hold of some Demo Democratic National Convention email exchanges where they had talked about a pizza joint in um, suburban Maryland or in Washington, DC. And it turns out the pizza joint is just a mom and pop pizza joint that's got, you know, they have birthday parties and video games in the back in the basement and all that. And there's a guy who was, I forget his name, he was, 
got himself really deep into this whole, whole QAnon rabbit hole and got himself talked into a bunch of crazy ideas here and convinced himself that Hillary Clinton was running a uh, child slavery, sex slavery ring out of the basement of that pizza place in Washington, D.C. And he got in his car and drove for several hours with his gun and showed up at the pizza place and broke in, broke in and went downstairs and scared a bunch of people and shot some shots. I don't think he hurt anybody. And he broke down the door to the in the basement of the pizza place, only to find out that it had brooms and mops and cleaning chemicals in there. It was just a broom closet, but he was convinced that that's where they were running the child slavery sex ring out that Hillary Clinton was responsible for. You know, and there's a whole bunch of other examples, cases like that. And he's since kind of sobered up. They, they put him in jail, but he's since kind of sobered up and realized how far off the rails he went with that. And sometimes people have this kind of weird come to Jesus moment where they kind of shake out of it and realize that they've been, it's the same thing happened with some of the January 6th um, Capitol insurrectionists who invaded and attacked the Capitol building and went into Congress screaming that they were going to lynch Mike Pence on Trump's behalf for the save the election. And some of those folks are now, at least in court, defending themselves by saying, oh, well, I just lost my mind because I was reading too much of this QAnon conspiracy stuff about what was going on. Now, some folks are, making a, are gonna push back, I suppose, on me. I mean, I, I can give some examples of people on the left um, who have weird ideas too. The, the whole anti-vaxxer idea is not a new and it's not a Republican idea the anti-vax conspiracies or at least suspicions were common among like suburban liberal democrat housewives in the pacific northwest who were kind of crunchy hippie moms who didn't want to you know they wanted to feed their kids only whole foods and didn't want the kids to have any processed foods and they were suspicious about pediatricians who wanted to give them measles vaccines and and mumps and rubella vaccines and the like. And that all actually started and then it got exacerbated by this um, urban myth that vaccines cause autism. So, you know, that, that sentiment has been circulating out around there for a while. So that's kind of a equal opportunity. Crazy. But Sina, may I tell you, so in the bigger scheme of things, uh, when you integrate these types of things or space or time, wouldn't uh, Darwinian evolution kick in and people and uh, teams and individuals and families yeah, sure. that are making uh, smart choices, uh, staying safe, getting ahead in life, you know, that kind of a thing that they will, with all this other chaos going in as well, they will continue to thrive uh, and some of these other, you know, elements, while they may create a have a care or there, will be somewhat short lived, and there wouldn't be billions of their offsprings because of the Darwinian evolution. They had that whole fitness function, utility function. Do you yeah. think that? that would, you know, while volatility would be increased, but will still, you know, continue to make, make, make progress in uh, the, whatever the, the, the good is from a fitness perspective for us as a species or whatever becomes of us would continue to, you know, outweigh the bad because at the end of the day, you know, we have this uh, insatiable desire to, uh, to, to survive and, you know, right. become better and, you know, and all that good stuff. One, I'll just make one other quick comment here on the, you know, the hope side of thing. When I uh, travel around the world to, and I was, I, I don't know whether I ever shared this with you or not, but I was born in a village of Pakistan mm -hmm. and uh, compared to the seventies where I was brought up in that village with no infrastructure. And even today uh, uh, it is a, whole different sort of setup and so much more, uh, so much more opportunity and whatnot. And just a funny point that, you know, many years ago, uh, my, you know, seven, eight years ago, my father passed away and I was just, you know, uh, there uh, at his grave, grave paying visit to him and whatnot. Uh, so this, you know, uh, 
a person walks up to me. Uh, uh, so people in the, that part of the world, Indian Pakistani graveyards. So people who kind of take care of graves and, you know, and these are mud graves and, uh, you know, they, they water them and uh, keep them in shape. And when somebody comes with it, they put flowers and candles and stuff. So they have a little ecosystem going on. So, okay. So this guy walks up to me and say, okay, you know, if you like, you know, I can, you know, uh, take care of it and this and that. And I said, absolutely, you know, please do. And I gave him some money. And then he said, no, 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 you know, uh, uh, I, I can't take your cash. I said, so then how do I pay you? And then he pulls up his little Chinese cell phone. He said, well, so there they have this application called ePASA to transfer money from one cell phone right. to another. He said, just send me some ePASA. I am in this, <laughs> I'm in this graveyard yeah. and looking at my dad's grave, which is not maybe in that great of a shape. And this guy out of nowhere walks up to me and says, I'll take care of it. And then he says, right i will give me your phone number and i said why do you need my phone number i'll just send you this epass or thing he said sir how how do you know that i'm taking a good care of it i am going to take pictures of my work i'm going to send it to you so that you can see what i'm doing to your dad's grave and look and then he throws a little business school at me matt he says well sir the person in this grave even though you are paying me but he is my customer. I have to take care of him. You are just a paying customer, but I have to live with him here. This is where I live. Yeah. I said, man, well, you have a cell phone. You're gonna send me a picture of this work. Right. You, you won't accept cash. You want me to send you e pesa okay? And then you just told me that your customer is my dad in his grave. And right. the point is, I, uh, even in all these situations, when I see uh, Matt, uh, people given an opportunity to make economic progress, right? I yet have to find somebody who freaking don't like their iPhone, or right. you know, don't like a good piece of music or a good movie. Uh, it is just funny that you know, back home, the, the whole Pakistan India thing. You know, they go crazy about each other uh, all the time. But guess what? Pakistanis love doing. L while we are not fighting with Indians, we love listening to the Indian music. <laughs> which, mo right. which movies, we right. love watching right. the, the Bollywood movies, the equivalent yeah. of Hollywood yeah. there. We love watching Bollywood movies. And then given an opportunity to people irrespective of whatever religious background, whatever that they came from. Okay, you know, if I can feed my family and I can keep them safe and I want my kids to go to schools, uh, yeah. I did not even have a bicycle, but I want my kid to have a car. Uh, I want my kid to have a phone. Uh, I need my kid to have a, compu my, a, a computer uh, and whatnot. So I see all that as well, which gives me hope that more of that continues to live that in a universe where there is an opportunity where people have work to do uh, and, 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 and there is you know, not a meaning crisis. Uh, I am hopeful for that kind of a world where we all have meaningful jobs to do. I'll give you one other just quick example then I'll give it back to you, sir. So, so in our company, Algo, there are 150 of us, so not a big company, about 150 people, uh, mostly here in the US, some in other parts of the world too. And it's a pretty intense software business and we are busy, we are growing, we are thriving all that. Many of us are here in Midwest and here winters are brutal. So during winter months, so since about half of my time goes toward coaching, mentoring, uh, my, my team members, learning from them, all that good stuff. The day is shorter, the, you know, the, uh, there, there are more dark hours and there are daylight hours. The meaning crisis takes a whole new level. People say, well, I need meaning in my life. So we have learned as a company, a small company of 150 people, that the biggest job of our leaders is to create 
meaningful, rewarding work for our people that keeps their dopamine or whatever other systems that allow us to seek reward and you know gratitude and all that good stuff for that to keep going. So I am just hopeful that uh, uh, if somehow uh, there is opportunity for people to, no matter where they are, to make a living, I have seen even in adverse conditions, people would say, I'm not gonna go and fight somebody's fight. Right. I like my family. I like my kids. I want them to be safe. Uh, and you know, that kind of, uh, kind of, it becomes the dominant sort of a thing only when no, there is no opportunity and, you know, it is total chaos and whatnot, then the ability for uh, people to get recruited uh, to those types of things is higher. Here, uh, interestingly enough, the 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 canon kind of stuff that you that you refer to uh it looks like a little bit of a mental luxury so so i am still living with my mom you know i'm still figuring things out and whatnot uh i'm still protected by the system and okay so i kind of you know i can i can get attracted toward uh those types of things but i just in general have more hope that uh that, that, you know, because people want to make, uh, even in extreme adverse situations, uh, they want to make their life better uh, and whatnot. So I have a hope that uh, uh, over time, uh, the religious divide kind of, you know, goes down. Uh, yeah. I, I hope that uh, the the ritualistic meaning, some some sort of you know the absolute meaning or whatever that people assign to religion, that that sort of become uh, obsolete and uh, religions or other forms of uh, divisive things just become you know the way to define communities and people are able to you know mutually sort of coexist. With each other and whatnot. You are mentioning the example of you know Israel earlier, so it, it is also interesting to note that today in 2021, Israel have diplomatic relations with many Arab countries, which was not the case right. 10, 20, 30 years. And behind the scenes, they all talk and cut trade deals, some on the record, some right. off the record, which tells me that this economic progress and that kind of a thing, hopefully will continue to outweigh uh, anything else. G going back to your previous point, I, I wanna share your optimism about the sort of globalizing humanitarian influence of technological and scientific ad advance. I. I and, and you're sort of speaking out for optimism about technology's ability to tie people together and familiarize them with each other and to transcend, you know, national boundaries or religious boundaries. And that, that's all very much in line with the kind of optimism I was expressing early, you know, that I had when I was younger about what I thought Google would do for us or what I thought, you know, the internet would do for us. And you're right. And by far, when we look at India, Pakistan, China, um, lots of those countries, we've, you know, advances um, in scientific and technological advances have raised all those boats and brought so many people out of poverty and done so much benefit there that we, we, we do well not to, we can't ignore that, can't neglect that. And what's happening there is, you know, greatly improving lots of people's lives. Like your point about the, the, the caretaker who, who now monitors your dad's grave and you monitor, you know, he keeps you up on it with his phone. Like it's got that potential. And, and I, I guess partly what I was getting at was talking about teenagers is, is that the, the circumstances we all sort of develop into now, we grow up. And into, I have to, I have to say this one there. 
And then that guy tells me, <laughs> sir, uh, I did not have at that point for whatever reason, think about how backward I was compared to him. He said, I'm going to WhatsApp you. I said, <laughs> and I at that point did not have WhatsApp on my you phone. You didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. So he educated me. So the I have, a, I have an admission to make. The yeah. reason I eventually got WhatsApp was because that guy said, well, this is how we can suddenly, you know, uh, with WhatsApp, uh, if you just are connected with the network, there is yeah. no text yeah. messaging fees and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and those kind of it's things. Encrypted and safe and secure. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay, I will get a, I'll get a WhatsApp and that's really cool. I, and I have to just say this one other thing too, on the whole optimism side of things, uh, which I could never have thought of, you know, 25, 30 years ago, a few days ago, we were just on a work call. This is Elgo, right? Some of our colleagues were here in the US, some in Pakistan, some in India, and some in Israel. We are collaborating with a company oh, in yeah. Israel. And mm -hmm. I just noticed how everybody's working toward a goal, a mission. You know, we were all collaborating and whatnot. And we were having a Zoom call. So it was a Zoom call like this one, you know, uh, that was crossing all kind of national borders. Uh, uh, since we are developing software, which does not require uh, the flow of physical goods and people right. to inspect this and that, and we are writing code and whatnot. I said, man, uh, this is good that, uh, you know, much less sort of, you know, we are not worried about what US government, Pakistani government, Indian government. I think in fact, there was a Chinese colleague on that too, but uh, he was here, uh, I think in Canada maybe. Uh, and then, this team from Israel was on the call and yeah. we all are on a Slack channel. We are communicating right. on our different Slack groups and whatnot. So I, uh, I'm in, in, in that sense, maybe I'm, you know, uh, overly optimistic or have that bias, but I am very hopeful that those kind of things will continue to win the day. Okay, back to you, sir. I, the, the future of work here is a really interesting question and, and how we all adapt and sort of shift and deal with all that's really interesting because the pandemic has, you know, forced this, this big shift and now people are not going to go back the way it was. Nope. And now there's this potential for all these new, new uh, ways to sort of work. In my career, and I'll come back to your aliens question, in my career, it's really changed things. And I've had to reflect a lot here about in the classroom, you know, we've shifted over and we do lots of stuff on Zoom and I do all my courses on YouTube, but I'm finding that at the end of the day, and maybe this is just because I'm kind of old school about it. I can give them lectures on YouTube and they'll kind of watch them and they'll get something from it. They don't watch them, watch my lectures as closely as you do. You're, you're doing it because you're interested. But at the end of the day, if I can get them in a room with me and we can talk and they can see me, there's something about that connection with oh, another no two ways about it. room that, you know, it, it just with these kids in my classes, just having me remind them, hey, you've got a paper due on Friday. And like having a person standing there telling them that is different yeah, than yeah. an email or whatever. Uh, so I'm, you know, in, in the education profession, we're trying to work out what's the new compromise here that will succeed. Um, and how do we, how do we get, you know, how do we become effective in the new sort of context? Yeah. And, and certainly to your point, there is no substitute to that very rich human interaction, but yeah. as also technology keeps getting better and uh, there is a little bit more of virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, yeah. then yeah. all of a sudden, Matt, yeah. your classroom is anyone on planet earth who mm -hmm. feels attracted toward, like yeah. I do, to kind of ideas that you talk about. The only reason we are talking here is because I, in some Google search, stumbled upon your yeah. YouTube videos on your theory of mind. 
And I listened to uh, the ones that you had on uh, Danitz, you know, coining Qualia and then all the uh, Stannis, Dehan and Nikash and a uh, and bunch, bunch of other models, uh, the global neuronal workspace models, the, uh, the, how Danit comes at it and how you framed all of Dave Chalmers. I said, man, that is like my version if once I have a cup of tea and I have no distractions, like we, yeah. evenings or weekends, that is like my idea of heaven on earth to say, okay, I'm going to listen to that. So I think to your point, there are both sides of this that we need our interaction, yeah. but at the same time, these tech, ever getting better collaboration technologies are going to take your God gifted teaching style and ability to explain concepts in a very easy to understand way to a much bigger uh, audience out there. And uh, so all those possibilities. Yeah, I agree. And I do the same thing. I, it, it lets me track down the things that I'm most curious about and then find the people who are explaining it in a way that I can really digest and really work with. And then I just like, I can devour so much of it that way. It's really effective for me, but I'm sort of self-motivated like you are about you know stuff I wanna find out. So teaching, teaching people can be different when they, you know, they're not there for their own sort of intrinsic motivation. Audience asked a question about, are the aliens already here? I want to make a distinction between possible and probable. And people slip between these very often. Uh, the scenario your, your commenter talked about saying, well, isn't it possible that they're already here and we just can't detect them and can't sense them or can't, uh, we don't have any way to know that they're here. I suppose it's possible. I, it's logically possible. Um, we can imagine some kind of stealth technology or something that somebody might have that might keep them hidden. But the, the mere, our mere ability to describe some situation like that doesn't make it reasonable to believe it's true. It just means it's got a, poss it's a possibility. And I'm always going to dig in here and insist on, and this applies to all kinds of you know, claims that people make, because I'm more a professional skeptic than anything. I'm going to insist on, well, look, but why believe it's true? Why think it's probable? And we got to have evidence for that. And I, I don't find any of that evidence compelling yet. I know there's been this, been this fuss recently about declassified Air Force videos. I haven't found any of those to be particularly compelling. Um, they aren't the sort of things that I think that people thought they were about UFOs and the like, um, but I don't feel like I have to defend a hard view here about that. I, I'm more interested in this in this discussion about big technological developments and their implications for our futures, and you know, uh, pessimistic or negative futures versus optimistic futures, and wondering about how we navigate that line. You've got some great ideas about that. And plus that raises this question about, well, if there are other creatures in the universe who um, have evolved and stumbled onto technology, technological developments, where would they be? What would they do, would do with their uh, technology too? But I don't know if I have much else to say about, I wanted to get all those sort of ideas out there and get us thinking about the, the vulnerable world hypothesis and thinking about the damage that technology can do and sort of the, wondering about one question I wanted to ask is, can we make any informed guesses about what's in the urn where we're pulling the marbles out? Um, Boston refuses to, and I wonder if we can infer anything. We can sort of make some Bayesian inferences about the fact that we've pulled lots of good technologies out and a few really dangerous and bad ones. Maybe that gives us some sense about the populations or the distributions of good versus bad technologies that lay in our future. And, but maybe you're right about the, the global influence of technology and the connection that people might have or some basic human nature that might prevent us from you know, doing something really horrible to each other with uh, some really powerful technology. That's an interesting answer. It's an, it's an answer that fits into Bostrom's paper. He says, we've got this diversity of values among humans, which is kind of a nice way of saying, there's some awful people out there who wanna do great harm. Um, and it might be that, you know, at the end of the day that the, um, the, the positive spirit, the optimistic, optimistic folks or the, or the people, um, 
you know, like like you're describing that those that those influences win out um, over uh, some of those more negative influences. <laughs> hey, if Israel can have a trade agreement, you know, with Arab countries behind uh, the diplomatic channels, then there's a lot of things that are possible there. I mean, if that can happen, then that's, that's one thing uh, that was said in those conversations where we were having all these uh, uh, team meetings. Uh, with all those types of colleagues, somebody made an interesting point that uh, I didn't think of it that much until this conversation and it just came back to me. Uh, so we also amongst other things are uh, looking into this idea that Facebook and others talk about the metaverse, which is uh, just you know a virtual uh, mixed reality environment that is rich enough for you know, as opposed to just this interface, which has its limitations for an right. interface that is highly more interactive and engaging. And somebody said, okay, you know, if we were to create such artificial universes that please to our common goals, states and whatnot, then wouldn't Indians and Pakistanis not fight and you know, or everybody would just, you know, because technically we are not physically in Jerusalem, you know, we are right. in a virtual right. world from our, wherever we are logging into it. And that virtual world, we all have created. There is plenty room for everybody. And, you know, and we are there because uh, we created it. So, you know, and a bunch of people who are not there because they're not supposed to be there. Right. So, so they were just saying that right. wouldn't that kind of, you know, if that is where people are spending most of their time interacting, collaborating, then there would be less of a need right. to fight on, you know, uh, who should have which side of the city uh, and that kind of a thing. So I just now I found this point to be very sort of super duper uh, interesting uh, that the possibilities of creating uh, these other sort of virtual realities where we spend a lot of time, we start spending a lot of time and what kind of dynamics will right. emerge, you know, uh, from that. Uh, somebody just, it was not me making that point, somebody else made that point that, hey, you know, it started with a joke where somebody would say, well, we used to, because, passionate people in a company, and it's a very open culture. We used to fight a lot, positively speaking, when we were actually in the office. And now in these Zoom meetings, everybody's so friendly and collaborative. We, in fact, for the first time, are a lot more productive than we ever have been. We have found kind of a niche on how to, you know, between different tools, between our GitHub and Zoom and right. Slack and few other tools, we have figured out a way to kind of collaborate and get things done. Uh, and even, you know, uh, for uh, now people are doing more as opposed to big meetings, you know, uh, if you and I are colleagues, we'll say, well, let's just do a 10 minute huddle. You know, we'll just do a 10 minute yeah. huddle, you know, we'll work on the virtual whiteboard, we'll do stuff and then we'll share it in that other Slack channel where so-and-so can asynchronously at their own time, they can see what we talked about. Meanwhile, we can work on our branch of code. And if there would be no opposition, because there is some kind of a Darwinian evolution to our publishing of software, then that branch of software will find its way into our QA environment or production environment if it survives all those things. So it is just interesting to your point that how uh, this COVID, you know, this new way of working is forcing us uh, uh, we are reaching out even more where we say, well, we no longer are just bound by to only work with colleagues in Southeast Michigan. We can yeah. work with them uh, wherever, wherever they are. This person asked this question, this is for you, sir, that most efforts for looking for aliens are outward. Is it fair to assume that probably they have similar or some kind of reflexive consciousness and is, and some of this is banter, is consciousness universal? Are we potentially all conscious beings on some kind of a network where we can connect with each other and we should, should we be looking more 
inwardly, like in our minds and in our consciousness, to find are there aliens there and can we communicate with them that way? Uh, so it is, you know, uh, it is that kind of a thing where you apparently some psychedelic or something like that, you are, you know, kind of on your uh, relaxing sort of, you know, dreamlike state and right. interacting, traveling to other, traveling to other Good. places. Yeah. No, I love these questions. Um, well, we can we can cite our previous conversations to get more details about where I think consciousness emerges and what it takes. You know, I've been arguing that consciousness emerges at the neural system level in a brain. It's not just any old thing that happens all over the place. It, it has to have a certain kind of functional organization in order to be recognizably a mind. Now that's, op I'm open to the possibility that some <clears throat> alien organism or some alien technology or some terrestrial technology could have it too, as long as it's got the right kinds of features. And you're, I think now, just for this audience here, in case they have not listened to the, we're going to yeah. publish all these things. Uh, so your thing there was, you define a mind to have certain qualities and, you know, right. characteristics and structures. And then loosely speaking, if a mind fits all that mindless stuff, uh, if it's a strong mind, likely that consciousness will also accompany and consciousness will also be, or some form of consciousness will be I think, yeah, present. I think it emerges from physical systems when they have the right kinds of properties. Yeah. Um, I mean, and all we have to do is just point to, you know, your noggin to, to get our best evidence for that. Um, yeah. And there's a whole big background discussion. We talked about it in our previous podcast, which you'll publish about um, you know this question about whether other stuff can be conscious. And I think this, my short answer is just no, it can't be. I think there's a good reason to think that doesn't happen. So if aliens are con if aliens exist and aliens are conscious, then, then there, there's gonna be some requirements there. We do expect them to have certain kinds of features. Now, um, but to the question of could we access or can we explore or get to some other kind of reality, including maybe some alien reality by way of internal investigation, maybe with psychedelic drugs or something. Really interesting question. Like I, I, I have circles of friends where people feel very strongly about this. You know, old hippies have done lots of acid and people who've had lots of access and done lots of drugs. Because one of the things that some of the psychoactive hallucinogenic drugs do is they leave people very, very often, they leave people with this profound sense that they have encountered um, a universal consciousness or they've encountered somebody else or they've melded with somebody else's mind or they've heard voices or felt a presence or felt the existence of somebody else there. So that's a very common experience. And I don't want to even, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't hope, help but poke fun at it a little bit but it's also really familiar and lots of people have that uh, experience. You don't even have to do drugs to have that experience. Um, it turns out that like uh, there's something called a bereavement hallucination where when, especially like when an old couple who's been together for decades, when one of them dies, it's quite common for their survivor to hear the voice of and even see the person who died in hallucinations shortly after their death. And that's a really, uh, familiar, really common event. And we know that it has to do with sort of the emotional trauma of the death. And, and it's sort of one of the interesting byproducts of the way brains work. I don't think it's because we talk to ghosts. I think it's because there's a natural explanation because of what the trauma does to brains. And likewise, with the psychedelic experience, I got to say, um, I got to say this, okay, look, maybe you're accessing, you're actually escaping your mind or the confines of your consciousness maybe you're getting to some other reality or maybe you're accessing some other um alien consciousness or something but let me let me ask this when you're in that when you're in that frame of mind or it feels that way what is the error checking um what would be the difference between um sorry here's the way to put it we know that the introduction of the drug brings on the hallucination and makes you feel that way. So we know that the drug, a chemical compound in your system is causally responsible for opening you up and making you have these experiences. Now, the question is, are they authentic or are they 
veridical. I wouldn't dare to tell somebody that they didn't feel or didn't sense weird things when they were in their drug trip. But the question of whether it's veridical is whether or not that actually corresponds to some other, some, re, some real phenomenon. And I think that's the one that's questionable. Now, normally the way I deal with that when I'm sober is when things look funny or there's, a, there's an illusion off in the distance because of heat on the highway, it looks like it's water. I rub my eyes or I look closer or I ask somebody else to help me or I take a photo or I use some other error checking method to, to determine whether or not I'm seeing what I think I'm seeing. And I use that to triangulate, corroborate, you know, and figure out whether or not I'm making a mistake. So I'm, I'm willing to entertain the possibility that somebody on a psychedelic drug trip is accessing another reality, but how would you know if you're not? Because we know that the drugs can do it by themselves. And we know we can induce these experiences artificially. So what's the difference between a veridical experience like that and, a, and an inauthentic one, just one that's just merely you know, your subjective uh, chemistry being muddled with by the drug? And that's where I always hung up on this. Like you're, you're feeling like you had an authentic experience is not enough to make it a veridical experience because we all have those about lots of things. And yeah. they're not, that's not enough. There is a related question here. Uh, so we are processing all of our prior conversations. So some people now have actually seen them uh, as we are getting ready to publish and all that fun stuff. So one of those colleagues asks this question that in uh, dreams, the people that we run into, friends, loved ones, uh, uh, people who are maybe you know no longer alive, they feel very conscious. So it looks like in a dream state that we have our consciousness, this person writes, sure. and then we meet all these people in a dream state and they seem very conscious. Is it because we are having some kind of a, we have known them in another context and we are doing some kind of a theory of mind attribution that, hey, I have a mind, they have a mind too. Or do you really think this is for you, Matt? Uh, that they have, you know, in that simulation, calling dream a simulation, you know, I, the dreamer, I have my consciousness, they all have their consciousness, and we are all agents in that dream and interacting. Yeah. And so, so that is a question that, hey, is it my consciousness that I'm projecting upon them, or just some kind of a theory of mind thing going on here? Yeah. Or in a dream, all these agents, because in a dream state, it feels like to me as a dreamer, they all are conscious that what would be a good way to think about it, an illusion, a projection, or yeah. are they really, you know, conscious? That's a good question. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I guess I think the only person who's conscious insofar as they're conscious at all during a dream is you. And, and, and I'm having memories and feelings, or I'm having an experience when I'm in, in my dream, you know, I see my wife and she says something. Well, I don't think there's, okay, so my wife is in the other room doing something else and I'm asleep having a dream about my wife saying something. Well, I don't think there's actually my wife's actual consciousness in the other room and there's my wife sub two consciousness in my dream. There's not like another one. It's just me fabricating that or my dreams are generating that. I don't think that it's actually duplicated the the actual agent. Um, and I also should, I, I think we should point out that, you know, um, my wrecking, you said, is it just theory of mind? That's a really remarkable capacity. Like I'm, it, it's inescapable for me that when I look at you and I see where your eyes are going, or I see your lips moving and you say things, I see you as a mind. I can't not see you that way. It's like this module that I look through that instantly organizes some of my sensory experience into that kind of unit or that kind of thing in the world. So it's, it's one of the things my brain does is project um, mind into stuff into the world very easily, very readily. And we're very good at it. And we have really deep seated emotional connections to lots of those. And we have memories and we have very rich experience with those. So it doesn't strike me as being, being very special or profound that I, we do it in dreams, I guess.
One other question that uh, somebody asked me to ask you is that uh, it's a two part question. Part A is that isn't it more likely, I think this goes back to the why, um, uh, uh, one Neumann's probe idea that uh, if somebody were to encounter us or we were to encounter another alien sort of beings that it is more likely that we will first run into either their technology or some of their garbage out there as opposed to actually running into them first because uh, looking and the argument that this person is making is we are sending our technology out there uh, and it wouldn't be wouldn't that apply to others too and we will more likely you know the aliens will their technology will run into each other first before uh, them running into each other uh, that is uh, one question yeah well that seems right i mean as you pointed this out earlier that it's much easier, cheaper, and faster to send signals than to send aliens. And that's true for us too, right? We can send out messages like the, the Hitler TV broadcast. We yeah. send that out a lot easier than we send out an actual probe. And I should also point out that part of the reason I brought up the, the Drake equations, the Fermi paradox, and the von Neumann probe as context for the vulnerable world hypothesis is that Bostrom is uh, wondering and, and speculating about the extent to which technology or scientific advancement converges on or un reveals destructive technologies that wipe out the people or the creatures who devise them. And you all like this answer. I think he would like this answer. There's a, I'm, what I'm kind of suggesting here is maybe what happens is that alien uh, alien life develops its technology like we are doing and then they blow themselves up or they kill themselves or destroy themselves with it because of this vulnerable world hypothesis problem that that's what's bringing um, civilizations down is what you know uh, I think is what Bostrom would want us to at least consider as a possibility good stuff man this is uh, really really good uh another really good conversation matt sir so uh i am looking forward to our next chat and thank you again for being so generous yeah. with your time uh we in the next week or so will start publishing all of that and then we'll uh you think about what we are going to talk talk next and hopefully yeah. uh you know if you don't chat in between sir a very happy thanksgiving holiday over to you and uh hope you get to relax a bit and uh and then we'll uh connect uh we'll connect next week thanks for the chance to talk about all this it's great fun and you have a good thanksgiving too thank you sir